Today we want to talk about a few different things. So uh, the title of our first presentation today is around using DevOps uh, and applying it to the network, specifically the data center. So that's going to be a big theme throughout our session today through the, the various sessions you're going to see. We are, of course, going to be focusing on two products that Nokia has uh, has built over the last five years or so, and we'll talk about some of our, uh, our history uh, as well. Um, so without further ado, I will jump in. So uh, first, I thought I would do a quick intro on uh, who Nokia are. Uh, as Tom pointed out, we uh, used to make phones. Uh, we still license uh, our name to people that make phones. So there's still Nokia phones out there. But primarily, we are a, a networking company. Um, and we have uh, a ton of products serving a ton of different purposes, right the way through SD-WAN, optics, uh, WAN, core routing. And now, of course, we have uh, entered the data center. So our, our most recent presentation at NFT was uh, back in 2021 at NFT 25. And that was when we first kind of introduced the two products we're going to be talking about today, uh, SR Linux and our fabric services system, uh, to kind of uh, maintain a theme throughout the presentation. As I said, we want to talk about DevOps. Uh, you know, it's a term that's been used a lot in, uh, in the application side of the world, of course, and we're starting to see it used more heavily in networking. We kind of want to ground that into what that really means for the network, you know, this term NetOps, as, we, uh, as we've coined, um, what that means for the network and some of the architectural considerations that we need to take into uh, account when we start to roll this out into our, into our fabrics. Now, to keep things interesting, we have a mix of presentations and demonstrations today. So the first segment is a, a fairly large presentation. Uh, again, I, I have a demo at the end of this to try to keep it a little interesting. And then we have uh, three other uh, segments, one to do with uh, telemetry-driven event management. So I'll, I'll walk through our solution for that. Uh, and then we will kind of uh, turn over to, uh, to my colleagues, Erwin and Philippe, who are going to talk about the fabric services system, which is our controller for the data center. So first, who are Nokia? Well, I know uh, from, from the dinner we had the other night, there was some confusion as to what Nokia actually do. Uh, for those of you who don't work in service providers or uh, in kind of that core metro aggregation side of the world, you may not have heard of us, especially if you're more on the enterprise or data center side. So I thought I would uh, point out a couple of, of numbers uh, from uh, Nokia more, more broadly. The first is uh, we are quite large. We've been building very large scale carrier grade networks for uh, over two decades now. You'll see uh, some call outs to some of that pedigree throughout today's presentation because we have maintained uh, some of the codes that go right back to uh, 20 years ago in some of the products today. So we'll call that out. You see, we are quite large, 2.7 billion euros in, uh, in net sales in uh, 2021. We're also a fairly uh, uh, broad company. I mean, we're only gonna focus today on our IP networks division. That is the, uh, the division that uh, is here representing ourselves today. But even within that division, we deal with WAN networks, we deal with uh, PE networks, we deal with aggregation networks. Today, we're talking about data center, of course. We also have SD-WAN. You may have heard of uh, our, our new Irish product. And we have a full suite of uh, a huge services organization to support all those products. We have over 1,200 uh, customers and, uh, and counting, and we've shipped over 1.5 million uh, routers throughout our history. Uh, we're number one in uh, IP edge routing. We're number two uh, for EMEA, North America, and Cala for routing in general. So, you know, we are out there fighting with the best of them. And uh, we also have a, a bunch of other divisions dealing with mobile networks to deal with fixed networks. You know, if you have a fixed connection at home, it's a good chance your connection is sitting off a Nokia uh, DSLAM or, uh, or ONT or PON. Uh, so we, uh, we're pretty ubiquitous with networking is my point here, as much as we have maintained a pretty low key presence in the enterprise data center side of the world. So looking at data center, um, we launched this portfolio back in 2020, so fairly recently. We were in the uh, heart of COVID at that time. We questioned to ourselves if we should wait out the storm. Of course, back then, none of us knew how big that storm was going to be. But we decided to launch, and we launched uh, three different kind of uh, products. The first is a fabric services system. So this is our intent-based automation platform. We're going to mainly hone in on uh, that middle box today, this digital sandbox for true emulation. We're going to see a presentation and a demonstration around how that works and how that can support some of these NetOps workflows we're talking about. Of course, Fabric Services System is, uh, is jumping on the back of this, all this intent-driven automation that we see throughout the industry. Um, you know, this is really simplifying uh, the inputs to uh, a network um, to create more reliable and distinct outcomes with some closed loop telemetry to make sure that that outcome remains in effect in the, in the fabric. And we'll look at some of that later. We also have a uh, cloud native integration model. So this allows us to integrate natively with 
the various cloud management systems out there. And again, we're going to see a, a demonstration on this this afternoon as well. All of that, of course, is built on top of Kubernetes, nice and extendable um, using you know, the, the open source projects you would expect to see in something uh, like a controller in 2022, things like Kafka, Prometheus, uh, you know, Keycloak, all the usual uh, suspects you would expect to see there. Then we have our uh, operating system. So we call this SR Linux. This is a bit of a throwback to our uh, service router operating system. As I mentioned, we've been around for about two decades and SROS is, uh, is that old. Um, we, uh, we basically took the routing stack, which was kind of the crown jewel of SROS and brought it into a modern architecture. So this is what we call SR Linux. So this is kind of purpose-built, ground up, designed for kind of this world of streaming telemetry. So it's natively model driven. And again, that'll be a little bit of a theme we see today uh, based on a standard Linux kernel, meaning that uh, you can potentially patch the kernel yourself. Um, and there's a big theme around extensibility and modularity, which again is gonna tie back into this DevOps theme I've been referring to. So we have a tool called the NetOps Development Kit, which allows customers or uh, partners to write applications that run on the system. Again, that in and of itself isn't necessarily unique, uh, but the way we do it uh, is, it all uses gRPC. And importantly, we integrate these applications like they're proper native applications. So this means they can have their own configuration paths, they can have their own state paths, they can populate those state paths with information, and it just natively feeds into the kind of the configuration and state tree of the system. And we'll again see some of that in one of the demonstrations. Um, underneath all of that, of course, we have our own uh, portfolio of hardware. We do have what we call the 7750 SR, um, and there's a ton of derivative products as well that is more purpose-built for WAN, you know, deep buffers, high feature set. But we do also have a set of purpose-built hardware in the 7250 IXR and 7220 IXR, which are purpose-built for the data center based on merchant silicon, common hardware and software designs that you would, you would see amongst our, our competitors, but importantly, having a, a full range, right from management floor through Tor spine, super spine, right the way up to DC gateway. So we have a, a full solution. Now in the data center, uh, again, sticking on that theme, we, uh, we launched back in 2020 and we've actually made a fairly big splash uh, in, in the market so far. Uh, there was a press release we had earlier this year uh, from, from Microsoft. This was using our data center hardware, uh, actually using Sonic as the operating system. So that is being deployed in Azure and that's all public information. Um, we also have some quotes from everyone in OpenColo. These were some of our initial customers that were very uh, hyped around the extensibility aspects of our operating system. And that tier one web scaler, we're not allowed to use their logo, but you can read the text that it is Apple. They were actually our launch customer. Um, so we worked very, very closely with them in the design. <laughs> lawyers, all right, lawyers. <laughs> so we worked very, very closely with them in the, uh, in the design of the operating system. And uh, they definitely had a lot of influence into uh, you know, how the operating system would fit in kind of a hyperscaler data center. Of course, us bringing our product knowledge to make sure that not only is it, you know, very, very flexible and extensible at the do-it-yourself end, but also very turnkey for your, your normal enterprise that just wants the network to turn up and work. Now, we also uh, have been engaged with analysts, and I know you guys don't like to see analyst uh, <laughs> radars very much. Um, I only put, put us here because this is our first time uh, uh, with GigaOM. And you can see that we are very, very close to the circle. We're an outperformer, platform play, not a feature play, and innovation not mature. So I, uh, I thought we were placed very, very competitively here. They liked the fact that we brought in our service router operating system routing stack. So this allows us to, you know, it is a brand new operating system, but we've been very lucky in being able to turn up functionality very, very quickly and leverage the, you know, hundreds and thousands, millions of hours of uh, quality assurance and testing that we've done on that routing stack inside SROS. They also liked the, the NetOps theme that we're trying to engage with here. And again, this isn't a new term. And I, I wholly acknowledge that, you know, coming up here and saying DevOps and NetOps, like they're new, is uh, likely going to get fruit thrown at me. So I'm not doing that. I will go through a little bit of, uh, you know, context setting of, uh, you know, the DevOps trends that we saw in the application world, how that has evolved in the networking world, and how we in Nokia have built products to try and see it through to that utopian vision of, full-blown microservices that can be upgraded very, very frequently. So we will go through that, but it will require some context setting up front. Now, another thing we did uh, when we launched the product is we, we realized that there was a, a bit of a need in the industry for uh, just simple labable uh, container images. So, you know, getting container images from our competitors is uh, doable, 
you have to typically go through a registration wall or a paywall or something like that. We really wanted to make uh, SR Linux very, very easy to use. So we actually publish images on the GitHub container registry. You can pull them down on your laptop right now. It's a full-fledged image with the same control plane, same management plane, and a software data path, of course, so that you can actually try things out. Um, the fact that it's not behind those registration and paywalls will tie into some of the, uh, the CI themes that we'll, we'll see today. Again, we've had very, very good feedback on this. It seems to have uh, gained us some good traction in the industry, just from people getting their hands on the system, feeling how awesome it is. Uh, of course, I can be biased saying that. And uh, that has in turn uh, turned into some, some very good engagement with customers. Okay, so getting to the main theme today, uh, DevOps applied to the network. So again, I'm gonna go through this a little bit tongue in cheek. I think uh, a lot of the audience here understand what DevOps is and uh, what it has done for the application side of the world. So bear with me as I go through this. Really, I want to set some context on what happened in the application side of the world so that we can really contrast it with where the networking side of the world has, uh, has gone. And then of course, I'll tie that in with some of our products. So I'll close this out with some of the things we've done in SR Linux and FSS that really will help us push some of these DevOps concepts properly into the networking side of the world. Of course, uh, that is a little bit of a, a clue that we're probably not doing a very good job of it today. So the first uh, concept I want to go through for, for DevOps, and there's a couple of them here, is around the size of upgrades. So DevOps understood, or you know, the people that pioneered the concepts behind DevOps, understood that there was a need to innovate quickly and to deploy changes quickly. So the real concept here is just, well, if I only have a small change and I roll out that small change, even if there's an issue, I know I'm only debugging a small section of the code. So that's pretty, pretty key when it comes to trying to be agile, trying to, uh, to get you know, new functionality or even bug fixes out into your production network. Of course, this is pretty challenging, and I'm sure everyone can vouch here in the networking side of the world. We typically follow that waterfall approach where you know, there's two to three major releases a year, sometimes four. And there's a bunch of maintenance releases that fix bugs, but typically don't add functionality between them. Really, this is one of those things that I think as an industry, we need to work on. We need to stop thinking of our operating systems or our controllers as being these big monoliths. And we need to think of them as things that can be agile, that can grow in one area without touching other areas. So this is one of the first concepts around DevOps. And of course, the second one is very, very much tied to it, was around reducing the domains of iteration. So- uh, Can I ask you a question about that previous yep. slide? How much buy-in are you actually seeing on doing this? Because you know, in the networking yep. side of the world, uh, you know, like we we range from upgrade to never to mm -hmm. upgrade every two years. Yep. Uh, so is is this really realistic to think that we're going to get real DevOps on a on a network operating system? Yep, I think it is very realistic. So so who's who who is doing it? Uh, now, a lot of the trend is coming from the hyperscalers down market. So that's where the trend is being drawn from. Um, I can't name names for obvious reasons, but we're being asked to support microservice style upgrades every two weeks, for example. So not every day, but certainly not once every quarter. Um, there's more of a desire around making those upgrades more reliable. And some of this will come into the testing part of uh, the discussion today, because that is key. The whole concept of CICD is important. I think for the vast majority of the, of the networking industry, they're not going to consume this in a DIY style approach. Really, this comes into some of the automation platforms. In the same way, if we had to uh, upgrade applications without something like Kubernetes and rolling upgrades, no one would be doing them, right? The reality is we are seeing applications get upgraded more and more frequently, despite the implied overhead of doing that. So I think the consumption model is important. It's why something like having uh, the fabric services system manage these upgrades rather than someone actually, you know, manually going in and doing upgrades is important. Being able to do them without service impact is equally as important. Being able to extend functionality is equally as important. So there's a few things that we haven't done as an industry for a long time. That doesn't mean that this won't catch on, I, I guess is my point. And we're definitely seeing the, the top down trend down market uh, at the moment. So yeah, I, I think we will see this, but certainly no one's gonna go in and upgrade their BGP stack every week, right? Unless there's something or some kind of automation platform that's doing it for them in the same way Kubernetes would on the application side of the world. Yeah, so at this point, it's just really on the hyperscalers because in, in my experience, the the bigger the network, the less frequent the upgrades and you know, yep. annually is about as fast as I've ever seen 
yep. a big network go and most yep. of them yep. are most are, are slower than that. It works don't touch the damn most thing. Most of them are slower than that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And and that most every 18 months to two years. Yep. So yep. When, when do you think this comes out of hyperscalers and who first besides hyperscalers uh -huh. are going to actually do this? I think the ones that are following in the footsteps of hyperscalers will be the logical next step. So your tier twos, people that are hosting clouds uh, and, and selling services on top of those clouds. I definitely think this will get pioneered in the data center purely because there's more redundancy in the data center. There's more tolerance for risk. There's also more of a need to move a little bit quicker, to patch things quicker, to add functions functionality quicker. Part of the whole, uh, you know, one to two year upgrade cycle is, is actually the problem we're trying to solve here. And uh, I mean, I'm sure lots of you operate networks and you understand how big those projects are. When you have to do an upgrade project, you're spending months writing methods of procedures, writing, uh, you know, scheduling maintenance windows, the works to try and make sure that something can go into the production network without an issue. We'll see some of the things we're doing on the controller side to support some of this, and it'll start to make more sense, I think. But that's actually part of the problem. That's a huge spend in terms of OPEX. So you can imagine if you could reduce these huge projects from you know months or sometimes a year, I've seen them run that long, down to a rolling upgrade that happens every month. That's very appealing for someone, as long as you can prove to them that it's reliable. So it's actually, we're actually trying to get rid of those big upgrade steps. That's kind of part of the philosophy here. And we saw this on the application side of the world as well, right? They didn't upgrade applications unless they really have to. And unless they were going out of support, you know, people weren't upgrading databases, they weren't upgrading web servers unless they absolutely had to. And we're now seeing, because of these concepts, that they're able to upgrade them much more frequently. The steps are much smaller, they're much easier to digest, and that's resulted in actually better reliability and a higher cadence of uh, adding functionality. So that's really what we're hoping to see here. I, I guess from my point of view as the crotchety old man, uh, this scares me. Working in healthcare, <laughs> I, you know, no. <laughs> well, let's, 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 no, let's, wait, no. let's wait until we get through the presentation you're, before you say no. Like you said, you're going to have to prove to us mm -hmm. that those little micro upgrades are rock solid. Yep. Yeah, that you don't introduce more bugs than you fix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which is the whole point of making them small, right? It makes them much easier to, for, for even us as a vendor to test. We know exactly what is in that drop as a delta compared to the last drop that worked. It's not 100,000 lines of code that have changed. It's 20 lines of code that have changed, which is gonna guarantee that they're getting a lot more cycles. So again, we'll, we'll walk through some of the concepts today and I hope you'll, you'll leave feeling a little bit more positive about this. I do think it's coming. How far down market it goes, again, that's a bit of a question. It may even stay restrained in the data center because of the amount of redundancy that you have in the data center and the idea that you could upgrade a pod and make sure that it works and then roll it more broadly. I, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky in the data center that we have that physical redundancy. So. Will this end up perpetuating everywhere in the network? I'm not here to claim that, right? There are plenty of locations that are single homed on a single router. And if you tinker with that router, you could bring down an entire site. So that's the reality of some of those service provider networks. I'm not saying this is going to get there, uh, but I do think in data center and some of those areas where you have more redundancy, even core networks have a lot of redundancy, you will see this kind of thing start, start to, uh, to, to be more predominant. Okay. Onto the second concept, and we kind of covered a little bit already, is just around making those iteration domains smaller. And this is, you know, the term microservices is, is thrown around a lot here. It's stop thinking of the network operating system as a monolith with a, you know, a chunk of code that does everything you need it to do and start thinking of it as a set of microservices. And this is important because it lets us potentially upgrade uh, or fix a bug in BGP without touching the surrounding components, which in turn results in less risk of fixing that BGP process. So again, all of these are fairly architectural level uh, things that need to be considered when you're building the operating system. We have done all of this in SR Linux, and again, we'll go through some proof points um, to try and reduce the blast radius as much as we possibly can when things are changed. Now, of course, as you guys are pointing out, operations is on the uh, receiving end of all of this, right? So we still need to operate the network. And this is where kind of that third concept that's been popularized, uh, CICD. So, it's a pretty mythical term, and there's some spins on it that are pretty questionable, like uh, things like using commit confirmed as a means to do continuous integration, uh, you know, bringing down your production network, but only for a little bit once the rollback happens, and some of our competitors are pushing that as an approach to CI. We really think that is uh, the wrong approach, and that really there needs to be a reliable testing framework that can represent production as close as possible, and uh, we'll go into uh, some of that when we go through the products. 
So CI/CD really is just around having a single stream that matches the production, having the ability to create a branch on that stream. And again, I'm, this is this is more generically CI/CD, not necessarily applied to the network. Being able to test those changes in an isolated branch without impact to anything, and then merge them back in, make sure that they validate when they merge back in, and then deploy them automatically. So you know you can imagine applying this to networking, where let's say you want to add I don't know, a sub interface to a new service that you've deployed, you could create the branch, push your configuration change into the branch, run it through some kind of uh, pipeline that tests the change. It could just be as simple as running a ping test from that new sub interface to make sure that it has connectivity, merging it back into your production uh, version, and then testing it again to make sure, because you know things could happen between that create branch and merge process. Um, make sure it still passes and that all of your tests are still passing, and then deploy into production. This is one of the key aspects to making this work, right? If you don't have a reliable test harness that you can run these changes through in an automated fashion and continually build up the tests as we learn about how the network looks, how it works, then all of this really can't be done. So CICD was, was massively important to this catching on in the, uh, the application side of the world. Now, what do we get? Some of them are fairly obvious. You know, we can move a little bit faster. We can introduce functionality into our networks a little bit faster. We can fix bugs a little bit faster using this approach. There is actually a reliability angle to it as well because those upgrade projects are less likely to fail. They're much, much smaller. We have a much, much smaller blast radius for each one of those upgrades. So all of that actually results in better reliability. There is definitely a curve where you're introducing more and more testing into these pipelines. But once they're at a point where you're covering most of the cases, uh, you can roll out changes into production very, very reliably. And these could be as simple as pushing a configuration change. They could be much more complicated doing an upgrade. They could be changing routing policies and observing what happens. All of these are really what we expect this to be used for. Of course, scale is another aspect because once you've codified all of these test cases and you know the pipeline is part of your interaction with production, you can actually take those. You're almost just codifying your different workflows and adjusting them, tuning them very, very, uh, very subtly. So you can imagine this forces you to work in a way where when you do something, you are forced to implement it as code, which in turn has a, a scale benefit on the tail end, not upfront. And of course, security. Um, part of this is that you can do automated security testing. You can do compliance testing as part of these pipelines. Um, and of course, linking into the microservice style upgrade, you can actually roll out security fixes into production much, much faster. Now, where do we stand? So again, I mentioned these aren't new terms and I'm sure most of what I talked about with DevOps, most people are, are fairly aware of. We've seen that thrive in the application side of the world, but we've seen the terminology in the networking side of the world too. You know, Nokia aren't the ones to introduce the term NetOps, but we also introduced many other terms, right? We had NetDevSecOps, we had NetDevOps. There's many that have gone around. And I think most of this is trying to put a marketing spin on something that isn't really true to the what we would consider to be DevOps. Again, I, uh, everyone has their own uh, version of this, I'm sure. Part of this is just that uh, we are trying to apply the same concepts without the same starting point. So we need to change our starting point is essentially uh, the message here. Now, in uh, some of those hyperscalers, uh, and I would even say down market in those tier two um, uh, colo and uh, exchange providers, we do actually see some of these concepts already used. I mentioned the SR Linux container image. We have some customers that before they roll a configuration change into the network, they simply spin up a container, they push the configuration to it, they make sure it gets accepted, and then they tear down the container and assuming that all passed, the change automatically gets deployed into production. And this isn't a manual step, right? It's part of them deploying the change into production, this happens in an automated fashion. So we actually see this being used quite a bit for configuration, the whole concept of configuration as code, infrastructure as code. This actually is starting to take off, but I think the issue with it is that it limits the scope here. Really where this took off in the application side of the world wasn't for configuration changes, as much as that was an aspect of it. It really was to handle the infrastructure and treat the infrastructure itself properly as code, things like upgrades, things like canaries, all of that being automated so that it be, can be consumable. So we wanna look at how this applies beyond just configuration. And uh, we break this up into days. I know we're not the only ones to do this. The idea of uh, you know, having a design phase before anything goes into, into production, a deploy phase where you're bringing something up into production. It could be a node, it could be a new service. And then a, a operational phase where you know, the system is actually running. You're maybe doing maintenance, uh, deploying new services, doing additional attachments to those services, all of that. We think these concepts can apply to all of these. And this brings us to our solution. Uh, and again, you'll see some of this in the demonstrations today, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much. 
We, uh, I mentioned the fabric services system. This is the, the tool that really forces you to envision those code style workflows where you know, it's basically a big API that you can throw your intents at. Intents can be as simple as you know, extending the fabric, adding new racks or pods. They could be deploying new workloads or services onto the fabric. And importantly, making this consumable to your average end user, not your networking expert. So most people don't wanna deal with the EVPN fundamentals. They don't wanna deal with RDs and RTs and VNIs and ESIs. Fabric service system kind of takes all of that complexity away and does automatic allocation for those things and maintains indexes to make sure there's no overlaps. Now, part of this workflow is of course something we call the digital sandbox. So I mentioned a CI tool, like a proper means of emulating a production environment and being able to run changes through it. And again, we're gonna see this in the demo, so I'm not gonna go into it too much here. This is kind of fundamental to this all working successfully. You have to have some tool to test the changes. You can't just be rolling out microservice style upgrades uh, without any means to do any automated testing because you're basically just going back to that one a year upgrade style, but you're upgrading you know, containers instead of binaries on the disk. Of course, we have our Estro Linux uh, model-driven extensible operating system. This is fundamental in breaking apart some of those iteration boundaries, allowing an individual service to be upgraded. And we do see this in some of our competitors where they will allow you to, for example, patch uh, a process. So we're not the first ones to do that, even to do that without outage. And uh, that's actually one of the demos I'm gonna show today. But importantly, we allow this across functional boundaries. So rather than just upgrading a process, you can upgrade a process and introduce new configuration paths, new state paths, and actually leverage that new functionality, um, which is unique to us. And of course you need the hardware to support this all. Part of this is the actual silicon that's in use. The silicon needs to support things like warm reboot. That's actually a pretty big hammer in most cases because the whole idea behind this is that you're not you're doing warm reboots anymore. You're individually taking down services, holding on to state and then upgrading them. Okay, so this is a pretty busy slide and I'm not gonna go through it all. The only thing I wanted to highlight here, this is the SR Linux architecture. Um, you can see here a bunch of boxes representing uh, you know, functional boundaries. In our architecture, every one of these ends up as a process that runs on the system. Um, now they share information, of course, using uh, this database we call the Impart database or IDB. You can think of this like SysDB for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with our competitors. But importantly, the management stack itself, whilst we still present a uniform API, so you know, there's only a single endpoint to hit the device, we allow each one of the applications to own its own configuration, to own its own state, and to publish them into that API. So from an end user's perspective, you query the system, it looks like any other operating system that's out there. But the, the, the schema, the configuration and state of the system can actually change based on these applications disappearing. Uh, and that could be a customer adding their own application that adds its own configuration paths, um, or being upgraded, adding new functionality. And I, uh, I draw this comparison because we are seeing a, a trend uh, in the controller side of the world. So, um, you know, the, the, the devops -y side of the world where we're starting to see Kubernetes not just be used as a kind of a container management system, but to be used as an extensible API through uh, these uh, CRDs or custom resource definitions. This really lets applications come in and extend the Kubernetes API with any arbitrary objects they like and to have the same set of tools that are used to, for example, spin up a pod in Kubernetes to be used to configure these new objects. And these could be you know, network instances or sub-interfaces or routing policies or, or anything like that. So whilst that works on the application side of the world where YAML is the language that's being spoken, on the networking side of the world, for better or for worse, we have all coalesced on Yang instead. So what our management server does, kind of that uniform API for our, our, our network operating system, is it brings together all these objects from all these different applications and presents them uniformly so that the same tool chain can be used, the GNMI gRPC tool chain. This means you can stream out uh, th through on-change telemetry any one of the state paths in the system that again was another core philosophy of SR Linux um, and configure these applications using GNMI. And this actually is extended to customer applications. This was something we showed at uh, NFD 25 where we brought in a new application that was not written by Nokia and it actually extended the system's configuration and state paths for these new paths that only the application really understood. So being able to do this is kind of fundamental to supporting microservices because it's not good enough just to do patching this way. You have to be able to add functionality to the system as well. And now we get to the demonstration. So the first demonstration I'm gonna to show today uh, is one we call uh, application warm restart or AWR. 
again, this is part of that whole story of an application being able to potentially disappear. Um, you know, we don't have the benefit in the networking world of simply scaling applications out. You can imagine if you have a core router and it has a bunch of BGP peers, you don't want to replicate the rib in and rib out uh, across a number of microservices. We also care about convergence time, so you can't simply put that in a database and use it when you need it. So what we have done here instead is to, uh, for one, rely on things like graceful restart. That's kind of fundamental, at least for the, uh, the routing protocol side of the house, but be able to hold on to state inside our impart database. So, you know, going from left to right, you can imagine in steady state, applications come online, they publish data they want to share to the impart database, they subscribe to other applications data. In the event that they have a failure, um, our system will automatically restart them. They simply restart and go, well, I was alive before, so I'm going to go check the database to see if there's any information that I had stored previously. This lets us do things like, uh, and again, we'll see this in the demonstration, take an application offline, but the functionality that that application brought to the system, in this case, we're going to show it for static routes, actually remains. So, you know, the routing table doesn't change, the FIB doesn't change. And you can actually extend this for the upgrade use case, which again, we are going to show today, where we upgrade an individual application and we actually introduce new functionality in the application and we rename some paths and our data path remains unimpacted by the change. So all of these are kind of fundamental, right? We can't cause outages, we need to be able to add functionality and we can't cause a, an alarm storm when we do this. So you kind of need to hide and dampen the, the change from the, the broader ecosystem that you're, you're living in. Okay, so the demo topology and uh, I'm gonna reuse this topology for the, uh, the next demo as well. Really, you can think of it as uh, leaves and spines, dot two, dot four are uh, our leaves and dot one is the spine. We're gonna be working on dot one and I'm gonna have uh, a ping because we all love ping running between dot two and dot four through dot one. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the context for the demonstration here. What are you guys using for your routing engine? Is it just a fork of Zebra or? Uh, it's uh, our service router operating system. So it's actually our own homegrown operating system. The one that we, we deploy in, in WAN networks today. Okay. Yeah, so the routing stack is all, all hand grown by, uh, by Nokia over the last two decades. In fact, that was one of the main uh, things we did with SR Linux. We didn't want to break ties to our routing stack. Uh, other competitors have done that and they've branched. We actually merge in the routing stack from uh, SR OS uh, pretty much every night into, into SR Linux. So, you know, if a bug gets fixed for some MPLS issue, for some carrier in Europe, we get the fix in uh, SR Linux the next day. So all of our testing, all of our feature development happens in SR OS and then comes into SR Linux that way. And this actually really helped us because, you know, you can almost think of SR Linux as a little bit of a startup and there's many startup nozzles around there, but our ability to introduce functionality very, very rapidly is, uh, is quite unique to us. A quick question for you on customer applications. Mm -hmm. So I'm familiar with doing things like that in the Cisco-verse, where it's a, a Docker container that you yep. can deploy. How do customers put their own applications in here? Yeah, exactly the same. I mean, it's a we don't container. Yep, we don't mandate the packaging. So you can install it through an RPM. You can copy binaries to the disk. You can copy configuration files to the disk. You can run a Docker container. You kind of get to decide how it's packaged. We don't mandate anything there. The main thing, like an application to us isn't just a binary. It's of course a binary because the application needs to do something, but it's also the configuration and state. So we actually expect a Yang module that that, that application is going to ingest and publish information to so that we can in turn publish that information to anyone that's subscribed to the system. And a small YAML file, which tells our app manager, you can kind of think of it as system D, how to launch the application. Where is its Yang modules? What happens if it fails? All of that is tunable. Uh, for our applications and for uh, for third parties. Okay. okay, so the first demo is uh, application warm restart. Okay, so as that uh, that topology highlighted, I've I've only got sessions open on two of the the systems in that topology. The right guy is my leaf, so I'm just going to start a ping here in our default network instance to ten zero zero four. Unfortunately, in fact, I don't actually really need this one to be that big, so I'm going to make that smaller. Uh, what just happened there? Oh, I think I killed my container when I did that. The demo gods are angry with The demo gods are so angry. Did I hit control Z? I, I may have. Thankfully, this is just a container, so we can just start it again. So is the container lab uh, stuff separate from S, the SR Linux? Yeah, it is. So uh, one of our, uh, one of the guys on, on my team, Roman, 
Um, he pioneered some of the Container Lab stuff. So he maintains it, but it is entirely separate from SR Linux. Okay. It is hosted at our, uh, at our domain. So it's on SR Linux dev, but it is, uh, it is, it is entirely separate. So it doesn't run the, the rear router OS? Well, Container Lab is uh, more of like a topology building tool rather than a, uh, an operating system per but the, se. But the, the SR Linux nodes that are running there, are those running your router OS? Uh, yes, yes, sorry, sorry, they are. Okay, Yep. because everything I'm seeing shows them running Zebra. The, the SR Linux nodes are running Zebra? I don't think so. <laughs> or I would hope not, anyway. I have network instances yet. Oh, it's actually config. Oh dear. All right, I'm not gonna run the ping. I'm not gonna <laughs> run the ping. You're just gonna have to take my word for it that it wouldn't go down. Um, so yeah, on the left, this is the, the spine container. Um, what I wanna show here is uh, a couple of things. So first we have, uh, in fact, I can just make this uh, full screen now. We have uh, a bunch of different processes here and we have the uh, static route manager which is the one that we're gonna upgrade here. You can see it's running uh, version 32849. This is a, a private build. Um, and the whole goal of this is that we're gonna upgrade this process and um, introduce some new configuration paths to it. So if I go uh, through the motions here, I'll just make sure I'm in the right namespace. So we actually have the images hosted in a, uh, a container registry. So I can simply do a list for, uh, my static route manager application, and I should get a list of images that are available in the repository. Now we can see there, I'm running 32849, which actually isn't in the repository, but I do have 32851. So this is the, uh, the image that I'm going to upgrade the system to. Now, uh, before I do that, we wanna take a look at our configuration uh, path available. So you can see I have uh, underneath static routes, we can configure a route, an admin state, a metric, a preference, and the next top group. This is all typical stuff. If you're familiar with open config or, or our schema, you'll probably recognize these. We want to, uh, to do an upgrade. So first, again, I'll dump the version, so 32849. Um, when I do this upgrade, a few things are gonna happen. One is it's, because uh, it's all gonna be done in a single command. Um, and we'll go to 32851. So even that autocomplete actually comes from tags in the registry. Um, when I do this upgrade, uh, what's gonna happen is first our app managers, the, our version of system D is gonna recognize that this process needs to be upgraded. It's the one really listening for this command. It's gonna pull down the new container image uh, and it's gonna launch it using a podman. When that container image comes down, it can potentially have new yang. Um, so, you know, new configuration or state paths. And uh, so it's gonna, unpack the yang out of the image and drop it into the correct location. And then it's gonna send a reload to another process we have, that management server, which is the one that exposes everything northbound. So you'll see it goes and grabs a pop image, executes a reload, and we'll actually see soon that uh, static route manager will actually get restarted. You see it's going through a yang reload right now. And it's done. And now I do uh, ground manager. But, uh, so it's running, running 32851. And if I do a uh, send it grounds. So we have some new paths here. So across that upgrade boundary, we actually added some paths. Kendall and Jeremy, the engineers that worked on this feature, they like to uh, be funny. <laughs> um, and we introduced this new uh, IGP metric leaf. So across an upgrade boundary, our data path uh, did stay up, although I couldn't ping it to check. Um, we reloaded the configuration. Actually, in this case, we, um, we changed metric to IGP metric. So 
we, there's actually a little transform function that's packaged with the upgrade. So this actually allows you to do non backwards compatible configuration changes potentially across that upgrade boundary and transforming the configuration live. And of course, we're now running 32851, which is great. So you can imagine, of course, this process is fairly complex. We wouldn't expect an end user, a human, to be the one executing this kind of thing, especially at scale across a large network. Really, you would use something like Canary to roll out this upgrade on a single device first. Then, of course, there would be a CI pipeline that would validate changes throughout that upgrade. And once it's been validated, you would, in some kind of automated fashion, roll it out. This is what our fabric services system will do as part of its mandate. 